Good day, everybody. On the name of the International Union of Architects, I want to welcome all of the attendants to this great webinar called Affordable Housing. It is a great pleasure for UIA to have distinguished speakers uh, uh, today. We will have as keynote speaker, Mr. Doshi and Ms. Is Sarita Topelson. Both of them have been just awarded, you know, Mr. Doshi with the RIBA medal and Mrs. Uh, Topelson with a, a great prize for housing affor affordable housing in Mexico. And I want to uh, <coughs> say thank you very much to Marta Thorne that will be the moderator of this uh, webinar. The same to all the other speakers, you know, from different countries. We have from Italy, from Turkey, and from South Africa. So as you know, housing has become a very important issue around all over the world after the pandemic era. And for UIA is relevant to talk about this issue okay, because yeah. nowadays, when you think about housing and you think about the millions of people that don't have a place where to live is like if they don't exist because you don't have a point of reference to them. You, don't, you cannot ubicate them. There is not a, a, a place where to write a letter to them, a place where to send some information. So it, it has become uh, like a, a sense of existing. And that's very important to understand that housing is the most uh, valuable uh, thing that a human being can have. And I, I believe there are many ways of observing, many ways of analyzing the housing process and many ways of understanding, you know, the philosophy of housing. Is uh, the conceptual point of housing is relevant. And we want during this webinar to listen to all the speakers in order to understand what are the different positions around all over the world? As UIA is created, you know, with five regions, we have people from all of them. We have people from Asia, from Africa. We have people from America, Eastern Europe and Western Europe. So after the pandemic era, I believe that all of us want to define what is the future of housing. And we want to define the role of architects in housing and urban planning as well. So because when you build houses, you are thinking in order to design a city or design a village. So uh, for us, it's uh, uh, relevant to analyze all the different aspects related to housing. So please, Marta, I give you the floor and begin with this webinar. Thank you very much to all the attendants. Thank you, President Jose Luis Cortez. It's once again, a great privilege and pleasure to be on the screen and to be connected, not only with our audience, but, but with these wonderful speakers. Um, today's session will first be a dialogue between Balkrishna Doshi and Sara Topolson. Following that, we have three more illustrious speakers who will give short presentations, and there will be a dialogue with everyone. And to our listeners around the world, there, of course, is always a hope that you will send in your questions to the chat, because we would like to also respond to your ideas, to your questions, to your comments, and we will do that towards the end of our two hours together. So if you will allow me, I will give the basic uh, bibliographies of Balkrishna Doshi and Sarah Topolson. And as Jose Luis Cortez said, housing is a very complex issue, but our first two speakers have different points of view, different experiences, but very, very relevant to this field of affordable housing, which we know touches not only architecture and design and our cities, but also touches policy and politics, economics, and today more than ever, sustainability and the sustainable development goals. 
Well, Krishna Doshi, a dear friend, and I feel that we're part of the same family, Doshi, um, needs no introduction, but allow me to say that he is, of course, uh, a well-recognized uh, architect uh, who hails from India, and he has been fundamental in developing the language and discourse of architecture in that country for many, many decades. As you know, he worked closely with Le Corbusier uh, and especially supervised uh, Le Corbusier's buildings in Ahmedabad. The Aranya low-cost housing development is one uh, that has won the Aga Khan Award for architecture and is one of his most admired projects. And we hope that Doshi will talk a little bit about that today. He also founded Batsnu Shilpa Foundation for Studies and Research in Environmental Design. And they've always done groundbreaking work in low-cost housing and city planning. Not only is he a fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects, as President Cortes has said, he has just received the 2022 RIBA Gold Medal. And I'm particularly pleased to remind everyone that in 2018, he received the Pritzker Architecture Prize. And I had the privilege of being with him at that time. And as you know, this is a prize, not only for the art of architecture, but of service to humanity. And those are things that have always characterized Doshi and his work. Our second speaker in this dialogue is also a dear friend and family member of our extended family, Sara Topolson. She's a Mexican architect and planner, and she served on the UIA Council, and most uh, wonderfully from 1990 to 1993, she was president of the International Union of Architects. Sara has also been involved in the public sector and she is former undersecretary for urban and regional development for the Mexican federal government. If that were not enough, she's involved in public service and was the founder of Docomomo in Mexico and the chairman of the Urban Land Institute, ULI Mexico. Sara continues her work, her very, very active schedule. She's a partner at the firm Grinberg and Topolson. And with her more than 40 years experience in the field, she's just told us that she's, she and her firm have just been awarded um, a prize for affordable housing in Mexico. So let me start by asking Doshi, um, you've been involved in um, social housing, the low-cost housing Aranya project. If you could sum up, what are some of the messages that are relevant today of that work? What would you highlight as the most important uh, lessons we could learn from that housing uh, development that you were involved in? You need to connect your microphone, Doshi, you're on mute. Hello, Martha, and also the, all the members here today. I am pleased and honored to be here with you. And uh, I can only say a few things that because of the Indian situations years ago, I found that the only way we can improve environment, we can improve socio-economic cultural structures, and as well as society's well-being, is giving a chance to people to create their own shelter, own place, own house. And once you know, they get into that house, slowly it becomes a community. And these communities in India are very large number. They can start from maybe 10, 20, go up to hundreds. And I think those communities which are in Bombay, Pune, Calcutta, everywhere that you see, 
what is amazing about them is the harmony in which they live but unfortunately they are not recognized neither they have sufficient infrastructure or opportunity to really excel themselves and become almost self supporting because of this kind of a situation i tried to make an experiment with the government project and that was aranya aranya is a forest that the world in india and this is something like 30 40000 pop population and it was a government of uh, madhya pradesh project and the only thing i found was that if i can give them an infrastructure and also provide some samples of how that can be modified extended or shared eventually everybody will pick up that idea and then they would slowly become a large community peaceful harmonious and industrious what has happened in aranya in indore is that over years it has not only grown but quality of life of people there has been remarkable almost like indian villages or towns they have activities they have improved and they got finances of their own they earn money they share life they share craft they share skill and as a result that community today in india is one of the most prosperous community healthy community and a community which otherwise one is not expected the other aspect was that how can an architect get involved in such a community and now give them a freedom what i tried to do was feeling that everybody is inventive everybody has a talent and everybody has a potential so if we can give them some sample some taste some infrastructure give them those samples as models ideas would flow and eventually the whole community would go on adding talent skill and independence and financial security and this is what aranya stands for today and i think uh, if one can see those things if you can visit us whenever you have time you will be able to see how it has impacted the surrounding area the regional plan including the government of india's policies every state in india has the provision but this thought of giving them a clue giving them an idea generates very different solution and this is what aranya stands for because it is positively growing community it has added new small scale industries and, and it has also closely culturally living community which talks about indian habits indian ways and indian life i think that is why aranya is an important thing because it is constantly thriving and enriching itself it's no more shelters they are full fledged houses the families there have very good life as if you know that it was planned and the community has other kind of socio cultural economic connections and i think that is the thought which is very important so i think in short aranya expresses what people they have not have not chance but it is possible and it can happen in any country or any city i think that's all i can say Great. Thank, thank you, Doshi. Let me move over to Sara. Um, Sara, could you respond a little bit from your perspective? It seems that Doshi was talking about, well, many things, and I won't try to paraphrase him, but it's interesting to me that 
infrastructure was one thing that he mentioned and the relationship with the government and, and also this example uh, to other communities, understanding that housing is not just shelter, but it's a place for community development. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about your experience uh, either in policy in the government? Is it, possible to, um, is it possible to have goals of community development in social housing or affordable housing? And what is the role of infrastructure in this from, from your perspective, Saira? And don't forget to unmute your microphone. I fully agree with Mr. Doshi that a uh, good way to build communities is when people start building their own houses and you start creating the community from the building of the site and the houses. And I also agree that uh, a shelter, a house is not enough. You need, um, I would call it an urban tissue that it's the glue that holds together any community. Uh, you can have a house, but never arrive to have a community. And I have to tell you a very sad experience I had when I was uh, vice minister. Housing policy in Mexico is related in general, uh, is related to the general policy established by each president during his term. So the president establishes the, the housing policy. So from 2007 to 2010 to 2012, the aim of the housing policy in Mexico was to build as many housing units as possible to meet the housing needs of the people. That was the main goal. Unfortunately, unfortunately this is a partial strategy. The mandate was build good houses not considering the location, mobility systems, or infrastructure needs for daily life. Well, water and sewage, yes, and electricity, but uh, more, from then on, the transportation or public spaces or schools or health facilities, they were not considered in the, in the budget. Three million units were built during the term of six years. So half a million houses every year is a lot of houses, but they were not fulfilling the needs of the people. Subsidies were available and people were buying small houses where at the end of the day, the monthly costs of transportation exceeded the monthly costs of mortgage, of the mortgage. So it made things impossible there but the government was trying to do the best they could with that view a new financial institution was in charge of the mortgage financial system sociedad hipotecaria federal a recent housing in agency was uh, in charge of allocating subsidies for the people conavi as the model progressed as well as the institutional structure, there was less participation of the Mexican state. And this new policy became a good business for entrepreneurs. So instead of being a solution for housing for the people, it became a very good people. Urban policies were disarticulated from the housing strategy, creating a complex structure and new housing areas disattached from the border of the city. There was a lot of sprawl leapfrog sprawl. I documented in, in a book that uh, speaks about sprawl in 140 cities in Mexico. And till today we're leaving the results of that policy that was so narrow in its view. Um, the big developers became the backbone of the housing policy, monopolizing the housing production of low-income housing without asking the people, because of course you can buy a build houses, but you have to have a, participate, a participative um, structure to bring in the views of the people, what they want, what they dream, and also to analyze the location that was so far away. 
Of course, the developers had the financial capacity and the legal knowledge that drove them to buy big portions of land at very low cost. As a result, there was no urban planning or regional planning and housing developments became dormitory cities with no sense of community. Exactly the opposite of what Mr. Doshi was so kindly telling us. These houses are not affordable in a holistic sense of the world because the sum of mortgage and transportation expenses could have could add up to 50% of the worker's salary. During that period, then we at the minister ministry tried to, to make something to reverse this phenomenon. So we designed guidelines for a new vision of any housing urban development in the city. The objective of the guidelines, of course, was to promote a comprehensive development of the project with criteria to meet the needs of equipment, infrastructure, and connection with the environment. 17 guidelines to create vibrant communities that include mobility, pedestrian areas, public spaces, shops, cafes, schools, health facilities, cultural and sports facilities, as well as all needed infrastructure. The problems that were created then are still present now. We have 1 million abandoned houses. People cannot afford it, so they abandoned it and they become very, um, very unsafe places. So we didn't get to what houses need. The residential habitat to be successful need to, needs to be addressed from a systemic approach in its, an interrelated set of political, economical, social, cultural, and spatial, spatial territorial components that to shape its production. This systemic approach did not happen. So what we're doing now is trying to recover all these abandoned houses, but the new approach of the housing policy exactly uh, takes on board what Mr. Doshi just said, build their own house uh, or buy their own land, but with uh, technical help, because we are in a seismic country. It's not easy to lead, let people build whatever they want because uh, in the first earthquake, it will fall. So we need to create a, um, an atmosphere that we can work together, architects, engineers, technicians, with the people and uh, have really a very tight participative, participatory uh, design so people find all the, they need. And of course, a holistic approach to, the, to creating communities, not just to building houses. So what we did then was just build houses. What we're trying to do now is build communities following the paths of Mr. Doshi and of others. Saira, thank you so much. I will go back to um, Mr. Doshi in just a moment, but we did have one question and I think it would be relevant for everyone. They're asking, uh, someone from the audience is asking, is there a universal definition of affordable housing or does it depend on the context, uh, the country? And I know Sada, you spoke way beyond the housing unit itself. But if you had to define affordable housing, what what would you what would be your definition? Well, I think affordable housing is one of the biggest challenge of uh, today, and uh, affordable housing needs a lot of definitions. We need a house that serves the the family. It doesn't have to be big, but it has to be probably flexible to be adapted to the different functions we do during the day and during the night. And with so much uh, homework done at home, study work and, uh, and office work done at home, we need spaces that are more flexible. The bedroom becomes a study room and the kitchen becomes a work uh, office. We need this flexibility and we need very integrated environments. 
where, where we find all the, uh, the needs that people live that I just mentioned. People need in their urban uh, tissue, a, a, a pedestrian areas, public spaces. Public spaces are key to the well functioning of any development. We need shops, we need cafes, we need schools, we need health facilities, we need cultural and sports facilities, and as well as all the needed infrastructure. This, of course, is a list that could go on and on. But uh, people need, need to live, we all need to live, not uh, just one, all of us need to live in a tight urban tissue where we can walk, where we can walk to the groceries, when we can walk to have a cafe with our friends, where we can walk to just to stroll and relax our minds, where there's a park when we can, where we can walk our, our dog, or if we're joggers, we can go jogging. So it's a very integrated tissue that holds the houses. The houses by, it, by themselves cannot function because they need all this, uh, I call it, and, and uh, tissue, an urban tissue, that it's like the net that holds the whole housing uh, concept together. And there you can have plenty of different models of housing. You can have single houses that I hope are the less. You can have uh, a triple, three, three level houses, six level houses, eight level houses, and don't go further. We need medium density to, to be able to have all this infrastructure and, uh, and a lot of open space. So this would create a, a, an atmosphere where people find a quality of life. Right, thank you so much. Um, Doshi, can you connect your camera again if you're there? I know he had an interview this morning before this webinar and uh, there. Doshi, could you respond a little bit uh, in your work um, as Sara was saying, the urban tissue is, is very important. Are there, some, uh, are there some norms that you follow when you're creating uh, affordable housing or social housing about the urban fabric have, around uh, it? I have uh, experienced in my surveys and in my life, visiting villages and towns and even developed cities. There are some remarkable cities, small towns, maybe a couple of hundred houses. But they have talent, they have life, they have self-respect. And as if you know, it looks like that somebody must be operating on them. So the first question is, how does one give self-respect? How do we create opportunities so that one learns from one another? How do Doshi, if you could connect your microphone because it turned off. Thank you. Please. Well, I think Martha is all right. What I'm saying is that individual eventually becomes a family. When families come together, they become a community. And when the communities work together, that creates a social structure and a society. And when they come together, they invent things. And this is really the history of great civilization. How do two ideas are very important. Self-respect is very important. Faith is very, very important. And not only dependence. So what I found Visiting the villages and towns in India, those which were really important and those where there was not only peace, prosperity, love, etc., etc., they were there for almost decades and some were some centuries. 
and they created craft they created talent they created something so the first thing that i discovered was that it was not one family it was a nature of community and there was an interdependence and that interdependence i found that if they really felt that this is their own ownership it is their community it is like an extended family so it is like clusters of more families come together and they give ideas they give clues like for example any good city that we go and see how does institutions happen how do they invent ideas how do they create things you know which we have never anticipated and i think that is something which i found that is why i found and i tried to create in aranya people's initiative so we build those 60 houses just to show them that how each space can be built independently and over time the house can become a complete house so those 60 houses demonstrated to them and they bought those houses and they created out of plinth and eventually now there are several thousand families staying and not only that but there is a it is look like that this settlement is there for decades is no more new one ownership is very important self respect is very important they don't want charity they want respect they want love they want some kind of an and if they don't have they will generate so the whole idea here was to pick up from the indian tradition and find several caste <coughs> several communities came together over time and created culture it was not individual houses it was not something that was there they did speak they spoke multiple languages talents came and a society happened it's almost like building a eventual a town and city where they all became one and this is really martha with the same idea and i think it has been very successful because similar places now people in india are trying to do so that it is now one sample government has done it at a small scale we built couple of thousand houses together they got a plinth only they got infrastructure and slowly the houses began to come but more than house it was the socio economic cultural development and this Dosh- is what i can say an example as yeah. aranya i doshi i also remember uh visiting one of uh your housing complexes and it had exactly what sara was talking about the element of flexibility it was a small house but there was space uh on small terraces that could then be used for different things and populated there were um back patios and different areas um do you think that flexibility will be even more important in the future as we think of as uh, uh jose luis cortez has said um with the difficulties of the pandemic and the need for flexibility as sara topolson has also echoed was this something that you tried to put in your architecture as you created affordable housing or social housing and will it yes, be more I think, important uh, Martha, most of the things that you are talking was done, but the most important thing was India. I visited several villages in different regions, and I found some villages had unusual talent. Some villages may not be so much talent, and I was trying to find out that what made them do what they are doing in painting things not only for self survival what we talk about development of cultural nuances so special skills there was great sculptures great art great painting great cuisine and this is really what needs to be done so the first thing i found was not try to give them something but provide them something by which they own it and that sense of ownership has helped and today there are replications of similar samples now small and large scale 
and everybody is now trying to do and they they actually now earn money to build four three stories four stories out of plinth there is no struggle they are thinking about challenging themselves and i think that was a very important thing ownership self respect and challenging the talent Thank you, Doshi. Sara, just one, one comment before we move on. Do you think it's possible for government policy uh, to stimulate this idea of participation in building housing and to stimulate the formation of communities as Doshi has mentioned? You're, you're on mute, Sarah. I think it is possible to have this participatory uh, planning. And the experiences we had were very uh, fulfilling. We did some participatory planning, urban planning in, uh, in a few places in Mexico and people did show up. And you know we put the maps and they would put on the map a post-its saying here we need a school, here we need a, a health facility, we would like a sports facility, and they have a very good idea of what they want. I remember once telling them, well, we could build here a football field, and there was no joy in football no, field. So we said, you prefer not a, a football field. Yes, the kids here want a velodrome. They want, and it's the same space. So you have to listen to people because then they, whatever you build with them becomes part of, what, of their decision. So they adopt it as theirs. And then the community really gets tight. And what Mr. Doshi said, they help one another. And there's so much talent in every community that uh, you, you, you really put forward uh, strategies to build communities, even though even in places where they didn't build the houses. Because I tell you, in Mexico is a little bit complex, so that they own they or build their houses with the hurricanes and the uh, earthquakes. We need to build houses that will stay, buildings that will stay. But if we take them on board. It doesn't matter if they will be the dwellers or not, but they are the community surrounding the area where you're building. So they have the sense and the new uh, dwellers will adapt to the community as long as you listen to what they have to say. Right. Thank you very much, Sara. We are not blind. Thank you. Um, we'll, so the first part of our webinar will come to a close, which was the conversation between Balkrishna Doshi and Sarah Topolson. We hope you'll stay and listen to the rest because it's going to be very exciting, I'm sure. Um, but if I could ask our organizers, I believe we have a video from the executive director of UN Habitat, Maimuna Mod Sharif, and it would be great to uh, hear this video. Thank you. Lo que no dije antes. Friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to be addressing you today. And I wish to thank the International Union of Architects for organizing this event in preparation for the International Forum that will be held in Madrid in 2022. Affordability is one of the seven components of the right to adequate housing and is critical in reaching the goals of 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda to ensure that no one and no place is left behind. The lack of affordable solutions increasingly pushes people into sharing overcrowded, unsafe, and poorly insulated dwellings, or to move into areas of cities with little access to employment and education opportunities, healthcare, or green spaces. More and more people are affected by the lack of affordable housing, especially persons with low income, young people, senior citizens, 
and large families with children, particularly in big cities. Recent data suggests that around 80% of cities worldwide do not have affordable housing option for people on the median income. This can be seen in Latin America, where high house prices and inaccessible housing finance are forcing people to resort to living in informal settlements. In many parts of Africa, where less than 10% of households can afford a mortgage, even for the cheapest newly built house. In Europe, where housing prices have grown three times faster than incomes in the past 20 years. Worryingly, this unaffordability trend seems to be worsened in the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis with rising levels of unemployment and poverty, which are in turn matched with a constant increase in housing prices. As noted in our flagship report, cities and pandemics towards a more just, green and healthy future, tackling challenges from COVID-19 pandemic, climate and housing emergencies will require a new social contract based on access to adequate housing for all and on governmental interventions to respect, protect, and fulfill this fundamental right. To this end, governments need to coordinate policies purposefully by ensuring complementarily between objective key stakeholder roles, resources, and actions. We also believe that achieving the right to adequate housing for all needs to be ultimately recognized as a responsibility shared with other stakeholders, including architects and practitioners. Your role is critical to develop sustainable and affordable solutions that can be scaled up for quality housing production and refurbishment of existing buildings by footing people at the center of the process. Your experience and expertise is also central to ensuring that housing is integrated in urban planning, is connected to the urban fabric and basic services. You also have a unique role to play to make sure that local materials and traditional techniques are leveraged to promote sustainable and affordable housing solutions. Let me end by stressing the importance of our cooperation, especially in the running up to the International Forum next year to find solutions to face the housing affordability challenge, leaving no one and no place behind. Thank you, and I wish you a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, those inspiring words. And let's move right, right on. Um, I'd like to introduce Heather Dodd. Heather Dodd is a South African architect and a partner at the Johannesburg-based Savage and Dodd Architects, which she co-founded in 1998. Um, they undertake a broad range of projects from social housing and urban regeneration to public buildings, university facilities, new and uh, new complexes and uh, refurbishment and additions and alterations to existing buildings. Um, Heather Dodd is specialized in social housing and adaptive reuse and repurposing. They're dedicated to green architecture, and I was so pleased to hear that she's a firm believer in using housing as an urban, as urban generation to repurpose the city and a way to address inequality and provide dignity. And this seems to link back to our first part of the conversation. So Heather, welcome to the webinar. Let me turn the floor over to you. And if you would present uh, your, your ideas in the next 10 minutes, um, I, I know that we're all very interested to hear your point of view. Thank you for the introduction. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I just, I don't have a, a, a timer on for uh, the 
10 minutes, so if I can just put that on. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Heather Dodd. I'm an architect uh, living and working in Johannesburg, South Africa. So it's not. Thank you for inviting me to this webinar representing Region 5, and I'm honored to present in such esteemed company, Doshi's Workers has always been very inspirational to my practice. Um, this is a very daunting task and the issues in relation to housing in such a vast region are extremely varied, yet we share a series of common challenges. The continent of Africa is the world's, world's youngest continent in terms of the average age of its population, with in many cases, the oldest leaders. We have sprawling low rise, high density cities that spread ever outwards. Growth in cities is going to be in sub-Saharan Africa. They're going to require innovative thought. Land issues and lack of housing finance remain challenges resulting in households being the primary supplier of their own affordable housing, incrementally realizing the goal for adequate housing. The reality of living on the edge of the city is a lack of services, amenities, and transport. It is very expensive to live here with very few economic opportunities. In times of COVID, most are having to do more, make do with less. In many cases, we continue to reproduce what we have inherited. We still retain colonial legacies in relation to urban policies. Africa remains energy poor and carbon dependent. Whilst the debates on cities and housing in the global north are moving towards decarbonizing net zero sustainable cities. Yet the resources to drive this are coming primarily from Africa, continuing historic extractive economic policies. The challenges seem insurmountable. In many cases, the political popular response is to punt the building of new smart cities, exacerbating the issue of urban sprawl. Post-1994 South Africa embarked on a massive housing program embedded in a progressive rights-based housing policy the state provided a million houses in a five-year period, yet our cities remain some of the most unequal. This inequality is the product of design. There was an understanding that a stable democratic future was tied to the dignity and stability that a house brings. Post-apartheid Johannesburg attempted to address spatial inequality through restructuring the extents of the city, but this resulted in an extended edge city which is largely monofunctional. This post post city is revealed as a sprawling city with low income housing located far away from any amenities and poorly served with transportation. Many of these areas have densified with incrementally built backyard shacks into a dense edge city, whilst the suburban areas have evolved a gated housing model and neither is sustainable. Focusing on the city in which we work, Johannesburg, our challenge in everything we do is to continue addressing spatial transformation in pursuit of a just city. The provision of housing is key to this. Through adapting, transforming, and inserting housing and the supportive components of sustainable cities into an existing fabric. Space matters and place matters. In our work, we focus on using housing to repurpose the city, using housing strategically to address spatial inequality. This is in terms of what I am calling a practice of small moves. This is informed through keen observational practice within the places we work. Observing how people use space informs how we think about shifting the boundaries of our practice. In the inner city of Johannesburg, there are several advert walls where spaces for rent are advertised. The special squeeze of finding well-located affordable space is revealed in the adverts, rooms, balconies for rent, and shared space are the norm. The city is changing fast. It is incrementally densifying through a process of adding multiple units onto residential stands. This is both good and bad. It illustrates the intensity of the housing challenge and that as architects, we can sit on the sidelines and watch or actively engage in trying to make a better city. Our small moves inserts new housing and adapts, transforms and repurposes existing buildings. In this, we hope to reimagine and repurpose the city. But the big moves that deal with the supportive service and social infrastructure that should be provided by public entities is lagging. More than 40,000 additional 
housing units had been added into the inner city of Johannesburg over the past 10 to 15 years with almost zero public investment in public space, schools, et cetera, in this space. I will um, now show some examples. The first example I show illustrates the insertion of social housing into the inner city of Johannesburg. The second example illustrates the adaptation of an industrial building to housing. And the last unbuilt example shows the repurposing of an existing shopping center into a multifunctional precinct with housing plugging onto the existing infrastructure. On the left is a social housing project that we did in the early 2000s called Elangeni. It was an insertion um, into the existing, uh, an existing brownfield site. And on the right, a tower uh, conversion, which was used as the opportunity for the major, major insertion of density balanced with the provision of social amenities. Unfortunately, we didn't get to um, follow through the tower project. In the insertion of social housing into brownfield sites, we consider housing as a verb, focusing on neighborhoods, not housing, not houses, creating safe internal environments, re-engaging housing into the street with live work units. And I think that our accomplishment, we hope, is that the housing blends into the fabric of the city as a background building that contributes to urban regeneration of the area. The second project I'll show, Paris House, illustrates what I term ordinary housing, using a series of adaptive reuse tools to physically change buildings. The city has changed enormously. There's no longer um, need for these kinds of buildings anymore. This is the adaptation of an existing industrial building, repurposing and changing the use contributes to a mixed use and multifunctional city as the antidote to the monofunctional apartheid city that we have inherited. In this, we've maximized the bulk of the building by considering the roof as real estate to add additional floors cutting open the building with new courtyards and considering a range of unit topologies from the room to the apartment to shared apartments, four rooms sharing amenities to bring affordability levels down and including a crash into the building. The last project, Balfour Mall from shopping center to town center, reimagines a shopping center and the infrastructure Working towards a multifunctional city, we believe that there are opportunities to maximize and repurpose existing infrastructure. This project reconceptualizes a shopping center as a town center, thinking about a parking deck as an urban square that becomes the heart of a new development, using the core infrastructure, such as parking, to service a larger housing development that can then be developed as something completely different and the life of this infrastructure is renewed. Again, this meshes together a range of uses instead of separating them. They become dependent on each other for their success. Here we are suggesting that a private entity starts to take on a public function. It reinserts itself into the urban realm and reinvents itself rather than continuing to exist as a car centric and increasing the isolated shopping center, hence the idea from shopping center to town center. The objective of all of these projects is to contribute to urban regeneration and spatial transformation. Through using existing infrastructure, we have a chance of making workable transportation, affordable services and accessible public communities, thereby contributing to socioeconomic transformation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. Um, and um, maybe if you stop sharing your screen, we can see you. Um, Heather, are, are you able to stay? I, I believe that you had another appointment uh, that would take you away from us. Is that no, I, I'm staying to I'm staying to the end. 
Fantastic, because I know there will be lots of questions for you. Thank you for the presentation. Let's move right on to Diego Zoppi. Uh, Diego is an Italian architect and, and planner, and he's also founder of ARP Architects. He's worked on numerous public spaces in Italy, the Mideast, and Asia. Um, he, since uh, um, 2016, he's been involved in the um, National Conservatory for Plan Planning and was recently executive, uh, elected to the Executive Board of the Architects Council of Europe. He's also a professor of urban planning at the University of Genoa and a UIA uh, Region 1 Council member. He advocates for the regeneration of Italian suburbs and the revitalization of cities. So a good connection with uh, Heather and our first two speakers. Diego, it's a pleasure to welcome you. I turn the floor over to you. And if you would share the, the screen, if you have a presentation, and um, I look forward to that 10 minute presentation and then the questions and answers at the very end. Thank you, Marta. Um, good afternoon to all. I try to share my screen. Um, sorry. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Thank you. You might want to put it on the full view because we see the slides uh, on the yes. left. Wait a moment, please. Wait a moment, that she is uh, coming. Okay, you can see now? Yes, thank you, Diego. Great. Perfect, thank you. Um, basically, uh, I wish to, to show you some, um, some situation of Italian uh, <clears throat> history of uh, social housing. That's not the same concept of uh, the affordable housing, but uh, as we have to speak briefly about this concept, uh, I think may be useful uh, just to, uh, to start. Uh, basically, in, in Italy, people have a strong connection with the home uh, because the house has always been an important issue of Italian politics. And during all the 20th centuries in Italy, there were many laws on social housing. You see one of the first uh, worker street uh, near Venice um, made in 1920. And in the tradition, the house is the symbol of family wealth handed down from generation to generation. Today, so over 75 of Italian families own the house they, like, they live in. But it's a, a good, a good situation, but not so good because uh, this is, this brick culture makes Italian cities lazy to change, and furthermore, the laws deriving from the most recent urban culture and the built environment are one required that cities do not grow but evolve the existing to adapt it to new needs, and. Uh, that's a, that's a situation introduce a new complexity because it's more easy to use new land uh, to, to build in, instead of to reuse or to evolve the existing. So what are the new needs? Uh, basically, as, we, as we, we speak about house, we have to speak of person. Uh, Italy is in front of Africa, and so uh, we, we, we are influenced so much of the different uh, tendency of demographic, because you see the uh, violet areas is the demographic tendency of Asia, and the red one is the, demogra the demography, demography sorry, uh, regarding Africa. In the in low uh, the street the, the very um, um, slim line blue is the um, demography of uh, Europe. So 
uh, these different dynamics uh, uh, produce a, and will produce a, a strong migration, which will entail temporary and long-term housing needs for migrants. So we have to introduce new categories for affordable housing. And in Italy, what happened? Italy has a division by age group that in the last 150 years has been the city key with up upwards. And the elderly population became prevalent today. And this, determine, this fact determines poor social and economic dynamism, little aptitude for mobility and low rate of reproduction. And that one is a big problem uh, for the social sustainability of our welfare and our um, system in general. And the third element that is that uh, like in, in the most part of uh, advanced economy countries, the concentration of wealth in Italy has also increased social division, pushing a greater portion towards poverty and resulting a greater need for uh, affordable housing. So uh, the other uh, element, the other um, layer that we all we are speaking in this last years is the social, the, the uh, sustainable of the environment. It's not important the, if we uh, we speak about 17 or or 15, but generally cities and buildings are uh, responsible of a long part of the 36 billion of tons of CO2 that we get into atmosphere each year. So we have to modify our buildings also with this new layer. And what are the keywords from for the next future? Mobility of peoples, that's not only migrants, but because there are students, there are new workers kind. The elder population is a big problem, new urban poverty, and environmental sustainability, of course. That one is the, for the, the, uh, the actual situation and for the, the future. But we have also uh, interesting, we have to, to understand some lessons from the recent past, because we, um, after the war in Italy started a strong social housing production program dedicated to the working classes. With a modest deduction from the salaries of all employees, a fund was created with uh, which 350,000 social housing were built in only 14 years. In this period, the best architects of that time were called and the average quality was more than acceptable. You see uh, these uh, buildings of uh, Mario Ridolfi that uh, designed a lot of uh, um, quarter and uh, district around uh, for, for the worker class uh, around the center of Rome. But uh, in the 70 and to 90, a new, a new season in which uh, Italy tried to maximize the production of social housing while minimizing the cost. So networks were built in areas away from the center where land was more cheap and also experimental typologies based on the large size and lower class only were used. Mono use, not mixed use. It's a big problem that one. Today, every large Italian cities has neighbors resulting from this period that represent a huge problem due to the low quality of life they offer, high maintenance cost, and low accessibility from the cities. Before uh, you said you saw um, a, a famous buildings uh, near Rome, that one is a, a district uh, um, near Naples, that one is near uh, Genoa. And that one is uh, near, near, near Milan, uh, that one is, was designed by, by um, Aldo Rossi. So a lot of these buildings, a new experimental typology was designed by important architects, but uh, the solution adopted by many local administration today for these neighbors is the demolition of these buildings. 
aware that the solution is expensive. It reduced the availability of houses. However, it's applied since the result of these choices is considered not reconverable. And in, for this res result, sorry, architects must be aware for their rule in these processes and avoid these results in the future, I think. A successful experience was at the end of the 20th century, which where municipality of Bologna began a successful program uh, started by Pierluigi Cervellati in an historical center. And this experience was replied in many other Italian cities. This program basically for the refurbishment of historic center were launched and included the large social housing quotas. Here, the mix of function, first of all, the centrality of the areas and the small scale of the intervention have produced excellent results. And today, these urban heritage areas have a good level of maintenance. Uh, that one is uh, a quarter in uh, near Venice and the other one, this image, uh, that one is uh, another um, district near Venice uh, designed by Giancarlo De Carlo or uh, Cino Zucchi architects. So I think that uh, uh, speaking about uh, the uh, regeneration of the city, we have to understand different from making the city and redo the city because the objectives and tools need to be changed. When we have to make the city, as in the past, uh, it's more simple because uh, we have to, uh, to create new buildings, streets, economic infra infrastructure. If we have to redo the city, as today and the next future, because we decided that our city not to be increased, but only evolve in the existing areas, we have to create the confidence and work on the relationship. And not, on econo not only on economics infrastructure, but on social infrastructure. Today, we, we, we are at the beginning of a new season in the European uh, um, areas because the European Next EU Generation and new EU Bauhaus programs provide economic resources, resources and a cultural address for renewal in a European city and affordable housing. So the Italian experience uh, provides for the following keywords, basically mixed day of functions, um, attention to the new users, attention to urban relationships, and temporary houses and reuse of existing buildings and the, it's a very, very important bottom approaches. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Diego. And um, if you stop sharing your screen, but stick around because the, yep. the dialogue at the end will, will include you. And I'm sure there are many questions. Let's move right on to our final presenter, Osgur Bingol, uh, who's coming to us from uh, Turkey, where he is an architect and a professor of architecture. Um, he received uh, his bachelor and doctorate degrees in architecture from Mimar Sinan University. And um, his thesis was very appropriately on mass housing architecture. He, is, he continues at that university now as an associate professor in architecture and teaches architecture and planning. He's, uh, as I mentioned, a practicing architect and co-founder of the firm BBMD, Bingo Barca Architecture and Consultancy. And we're very glad that you're specializing in housing and urban space. And Oscar, the floor is yours for your presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. And it's a great honor and pleasure for me to share this platform with you all. Uh, so I will just share my screen.
Can you see my screen? Yes, it's great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, um, as we witnessed in this platform, we may skip speak about the affordable housing on many different layers, uh, such as its political, economical, uh, cultural, social, environmental dimensions, or typological, morphological, structural features, or issues on its materiality, flexibility, and participation, and etc. And also we are aware of what goes around the world uh, easily today uh, using the communication technologies, but yet uh, we architects are mostly shaped uh, by the geography we live in finally. Uh, so our practices of daily life, local conditions, actual reality needs and resources. Oscar, we lost you. Microphone, could you check and make sure that it seems that you're on mute? And can you hear me now? Now we can hear you, but we lost your uh, we lost your uh, screen uh, there. Okay. You... Okay, okay, we're all set. Okay. Thank so, you. So, so sorry for the trouble. So um, our practices uh, of their li the daily life, local conditions, actual reality needs and resources define our main standpoint and concerns and so our professional struggles. So my presentation today will focus on the relation between the housing and the city uh, regarding the last two decades, decades of real estate boom in Turkey. I will basically focus on the question why we cannot uh, produce the city and urban life as we are uh, familiar with, while producing a vast urban environment in 2000s Turkey, especially in Istanbul, uh, the biggest metropolis where I also work currently. So uh, in the beginning slide, uh, we see a, a painting, a young man at his window by the French painter, uh, Gustave Kelebot. Uh, I'm just sharing this painting for you because uh, you see a man, uh, a young man standing in front of his window in his apartment and looking at the cityscape. So in my opinion, it's, it's an influential uh, frame to think about the private and the public realm of the urban fabric. Also, it's, it also poetically makes me consider the relation of the dwelling unit as a part of a larger spatial organization, the block and the city, like the relation between the words uh, and the language. So uh, the same level as in the painting we witnessed uh, 50 years ago, uh, Alan Cullohan had given us uh, one of the earliest warnings in field of architecture with his article, The Super Block, about the housing strategies of the market. Uh, now we are fair, uh, facing uh, severely in 2000s. Uh, and he says uh, he was struck by the large pieces of the real estates, he called it Super Block, the Super Block, uh, that are financed and organized by a single entity. And he questioned the consequences of the situation at two different levels, as I mentioned in Kalebot's painting. So uh, the first problem for Callahan was the what is what was the relation of the individual uh, dwelling to the super block of which it may be part, and the second one was the what are the implications of the super block as a represent, representational element uh, in the city. So uh, he was defining these two problems are in the turn related to the concepts of the public and the. Uh, private realm. And also in 2000s, uh, as Callahan, uh, we, need to, we noticed some researches developed by architects like, like Chris Lee uh, and Peter Rowe and colleagues on urbanism model uh, of the developmental state policies, especially in China uh, and East Asia in neoliberal era. So both prefer to use the phrase megaplot uh, which is almost the same thing what Callahan called as the super block. Uh, I guess to understand the actual urban issues, uh, also in my geography, we must understand this apparatus called either super block, super block, or mega block plot used by the developmental state and the market. Uh, 
and it's vital to discuss its consequences uh, of it on city uh, and the ur urban life. But before that, uh, in addition, it will be useful to share some um, statistical data on housing production to figure out the situation uh, we are in, uh, we are dealing uh, with uh, in Tur Turkey. These numbers are almost showing the amount of housing production of the last two decades under the developmental state policies of the ruling party. So as you see, uh, approximately in 19 years, uh, 10 million housing units is produced. And that means uh, in Turkey, we produce like more than a half a million housing unit, units per year. And besides that, uh, we, when we look at the uh, housing production of Toki, uh, Toki is the housing development administration of Turkey and one of the uh, biggest actor in uh, production of ho housing uh, in Turkey. So the Toki, the, the, the administration has produced uh, nearly uh, 1 million of those housing units. So uh, it has the 10% uh, of the production. And it's produced, it, the production per year is uh, nearly uh, 50,000. And the public housing units uh, is the 86% uh, uh, overall. So uh, Toki as an uh, institution produces uh, approximately 40,000 social housing units per, per year. But now uh, the numbers tells us that the real estate and the construction are preferred as the main driving, driving forces of the economy. And so we ask regarding the numbers, what had been produced or what has been left behind uh regarding his massive uh, production uh, let's take a quick quick look at the general characteristic of what had been produced in istanbul in two slides so i will just share two slides from the same uh, region it's the region uh, named kayabashi uh, bashakshir istanbul so you see uh, the um, just aerial photo and the photograph from the eye level uh, that shows the, the gated settlements uh, produced by the private sector or the public private partnership enterprise. And also in the same region, uh, you can see the production uh, of uh, public housing uh, produced uh, public housing settlements of uh, Turkey housing administration of Turkey uh, based on the uh, prototype uh, blocks whether it's a housing development uh, of private se uh, sector or the housing public housing uh, production uh, all are uh, produced on the mega plots uh, the land pieces in enormous uh, sizes. And also they are all developed in high densities uh, using the towers, long slab blocks, uh, high point blocks uh, as isolated housing typologies. And also at the eye level, first thing we notice are the walls mostly retaining walls and then the walls enclosing the property. And later the desert, deserted uncanny open space only with autom automobiles is left. So actually those photos are showing the ends uh, and what creates this uh, environment, built environment, uh, is the understanding of zoning plan uh, of the 2000s uh, in my country, as we witnessed in East Asia, uh, the MAGA plots uh, as an apparatus of the development state policy. So the mega plot uh, defined with minimum restrictions by the zoning plans uh, as an effective tool of the decision makers for the real estate operations based on the quantity targets. This image can be narrated as a drawing on which the aggressive intentions of the market and the political power is projected, uh, unfortunately, by assassinating the field which we call urban urbanism. Uh, it's 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 really hard for us to understand the scheme here. Oscar, Oscar, can Sorry. you speak just a little slower? We have some people in the audience who are having difficulty understanding. So okay. if you could speak just a little bit slower, that would be helpful. Thank you and excuse oh, me. Okay, no, no, no. Uh, I, I I was just trying to use the 
time as much effective as I could, sorry, by the way. Uh, so uh, here we can understand the scale uh, of the megaplot. Uh, on the left, uh, we see the megaplot and the produced uh, urban fabric on the megaplot. And on the right, to understand this megaplot scale, we have uh, an urban fabric uh, that belongs to the area produced like in, from 50s to 2000s uh, that belongs to another region uh, district of uh, Istanbul. So we can understand uh, how they just uh, lack the uh, urban qualities uh, and definitions of the urban space uh, is not uh, on the table anymore, that we cannot talk about uh, them anymore, the street, the courtyard, the square, the backyard, and so on. So if we turn to our topic, affordable housing, these two images, images can be the can be stated as the summary of how public housing environments are produced in the last two decades all over Turkey. Uh, a production mostly based on the prototype point blocks on the peripheries of cities. And this photograph is also belongs to the region Kayabashi uh, in Istanbul. And you can see such kind of uh, settlements all over the country in Turkey produced in 2000s. So here in this atmosphere, me and my colleagues under the roof of BBMD uh, try to create open environments uh, which would host different forms of urban relations, urban life and urban culture uh, while designing the public housing set settlements. Uh, here you see the images of the 14th district public housing in Kayabashi, the same region as I previously showed some images from. Uh, the project is designed uh, for the for a construction phase with the same costs, with the same contractors, at the time limit of the prototype-based uh, production of the same administration, the housing authority, Tokyo. So here we aim to emphasize the vital role of the urbanity and the idea of the city while designing the public housing settlements. And you will see a few slides uh, here uh, of the uh, 24th district housing. Uh, on the up, uh, you see the slides before life and down uh, after life. And there is a main street with the retail unit and public transportation road here, and some small squares on the main streets, again, with the retail facilities on the ground floors of the housing blocks and courtyards where the block entrances uh, are positioned. And here, the settlement as a fragment of open city, active day and, day and night, uh, though it is developed on megaplots. Um, Actually, we believe in the idea of the city as the architects. Uh, we try to design living environments in favor of urbanity. Uh, we just try to create simple, humane, open urban environments where can ur uh, urban culture grow. Uh, and we believe that such urban forms, as you see in the photograph, are already affordable, dense, and low maintenance. Uh, environment. So uh, to conclude, again, uh, I will use another painting of uh, Gustav Kalebot. It's the Paris Street rainy day, a frame from Dublin Square of Paris. Uh, lets us to feel the urbanity uh, with its urban fabric, urban culture, square streets, and urbanites, elegant urbanites. We feel admir uh, admiration for the city and the public life. So we need the city and the relation with each other as social beings as we try to solve the developing problems. Having only a roof uh, on top 
won't save us uh, from suffering. So it's urgent for us uh, to discuss what kind of urban space is defined by the large scale housing environments that are produced according to the zoning plans, which only deal quantitatively with the urban fabric produced on vast urban areas. Being aware of developmental state policies about urbanization and the apparatus that we call either super block or mega plot preferred by the decision makers may be the first step. And later constructing a position based on the idea of the city regarding the vital dimension of public life, urbanity, city as a work of art and reconstituting uh, the planning action, not as a technical device only, but uh, as a Stadtbaukunst, Städtebau or city making is uh, essential. Especially in a world where more and more housing is inevitable to construct, construct the housing problem of the masses and the global capital, capital's appetite for the real estate investments. Otherwise, we seem to lose not only the idea of the city, but also the city itself physically. In other words, we lose the urbanity. Uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much, Oscar. And it was a, a wonderful way to uh, end the presentations. Um, we do have questions from, from the audience. And um, just before we, we start the question, I, I just have to say I was particularly impressed that the conversation began with Doshi and Sarah talking about urbanity and urban fabric. And it was touched on by all our speakers to end with that um, beautiful illustration of the painting um, that uh, Oscar presented. So it seems as if you were in cahoots and, and I, I doubt that you were, but it's, it's really inspiring to know that there are many themes that are in, uh, shared across the board throughout the, the members of UIA and, and beyond. There is one broad question and it was on my mind and I thank the member of the audience who said it. Um, and I will ask uh, all of you just to jump in and respond. We don't have a lot of time. So if you can try to be concise in your responses, but the question is how do government and private architects and planners become more involved in and influential in affordable housing? And let me put it another way. Um, I, I heard some incredibly perceptive and wonderful ideas. How do architects and designers, how can you get them implemented? How can we become effective? How can we become agents of the change that you're proposing? Um, and anyone who would like to respond, please just raise, raise a finger and, um, and connect your microphone and give, a, give an answer. Diego, go right ahead. Just to break, to break the ice. Uh, I think that the new role of architects is to think of our work not as uh, simply a project, but a process. So we have involved in our work also not only the clients, but the user, and to try to create new relationship between the, the user, the final users, and the, um, the situation for which they can uh, not be only informed, but they can uh, propose something to enrich uh, the design and that they became a process. Uh, I worked in an urban scale, uh, not only in Italy, and I saw that uh, normally uh, the architects design a plan or a, 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 a project uh, smaller or, or, or a big scale, our, our, our works can't be end at the end of the design. There it starts a new, a, a new phase, a new level. And we have not to, uh, to maintain our role after because we are designer, not builder, not uh, uh, social operator, but we have to, to guess what happened after our design. 
And we have to create the condition, to try to, to create a condition for the future com complexity and future confidence, because uh, I think it's important uh, to connect the economic um, level with this new level. Without that one, uh, we are speaking about uh, affordable housing, not only real estate. Well, the real estate is more simple. It's very, very easy. Some, someone uh, buy land, uh, build and, and sell with a gain, mm, no problem. But where the gain is not so easy, not so simple, we have to create a confident situation in which uh, people are involved and they want to, um, to maintain uh, or to increase their role uh, just to go to, to live there. Great, thank you, Diego. Um, Heather or Oscar, would you jump in? Great, uh, Oscar, go right ahead. And then Heather will call on you after Oscar. He had his hand up. Okay. So, uh, of course, again, based, based on my experiences uh, of my country, uh, generally the strategy is uh, monolithic, you know? Uh, I believe that the subsidized housing uh, must have uh, many different variations and multiple strategies uh, supported by the government. If you try to do it in one way, uh, and regarding the amounts of the units that you produce, then the failure is mostly inevitable. So it has to vary. For example, in, our, in my country, there is no rental social housing production and all the production is based on ownership. And also all the production is based on regarding the uh, exchange value of the unit. So that's why we have to reconsider the uh, value of use uh, and such kind of, uh, qual not uh, qual uh, quantitative, but the qualitative uh, dimension. Uh, and also the decision uh, or the uh, sake of the uh, production uh, has, is not uh, possible to lead to the des only designers or the politicians uh, or the uh, developers, you know? Uh, so that's why uh, we have to rethink about what the urbanism is or whatever happened to urbanism we know and the building regulations, such kind of minimal restrictions also gives uh, really uh, so much damage to our urban life environment also. Uh, I think these are my uh, few uh, highlights regarding the considering Great. the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Heather, please. Thank you. Um, oh, I, Heather, I, if, Heather, could you move, your, if you have a telephone near your computer, could you move it away? Because we hear a beep, beep, beep in okay. the background. Thank you. Better? It's much better. better, thank you, thank you. Um, I think um, architects are often not particularly involved in housing. And so you ask the question, how architects become involved agents of change and I think it's very difficult but I think one of the aspects might be that we have to realize the links between uh, policy urban policy and architecture and exploit or stretch the limits of these um, often we uh, architects um, there's a disconnect between urban policy making and architects um, between planners and architects and I think that we have to engage more closely in these linkages and possibly and question these and actually become activists. Sara, are you, if you're here, if you could connect your camera, because I'd be really interested in hearing from you. You've been involved in government. Um, and one thing is social housing and the government's role, but how so could you could you explain how how do you influence government how do architects planners people with a consciousness about the city as urban design how can they influence government well i think we have an opportunity in influencing the government by 
showing them good examples of what has been done in uh, different countries. And I think in Latin America, well, in America and in Mexico, there are excellent um, examples of um, projects that have been uh, holistic and comprehensive. They are not the newest. In fact, are, they are the ones built around the 50s and 60s, 40s and 50s. In Mexico, we have very, very good projects built in that time, and they still stand today. And people did create a community inside, and they praised their, their, their atmosphere. We have one. It's called Unidad Independencia. It's uh, 36 hectares. Uh, it was in the city. It was not outskirts, right by the city, 37 hectares, housing for workers, all type of workers, 2,200 houses with a population of around 10,000 people. And um, what's interesting, it's from the beginning what they did, 1950s, two thirds of the land is green, is uh, open space. Of course, it's inner streets and public spaces, and only 23% of, the, of the, the land is building sites. So we can build three, four, six floors, as I said, but have a lot of open spaces. Then you create a good community. And of course, they have everything into in 20, 37 hectares. They have shops, they have, they even have a theater. So the, the mind was set on this holistic concept of life that we as individuals to be able to live in a site, we need all the elements that to be brought together. Of course, street, pedestrian areas, uh, green parks, uh, sports facilities, but also cultural facilities and health facilities and schools and kindergartens and shopping areas. And as we said, coming down to the cafe, you know, that, oh. that needs everything to, so that was one, we had another, we have more, but there are examples in Mexico and in Latin America that are interesting. So we should take our politicians to visit these places. What are the biggest drawbacks that they don't want to go ahead? One is financial. What do we do with the financial issues? So for financial issues, we have to have go government funds because we're building for the lowest income workers. So we need financial aid from the government or from other agencies. And we need to find land and land, not land there where no one wants to live, but land closer by. Or now, I think right, the, one of uh, the speakers mentioned 21st century, the refurbishing of our downtown areas. We have so many opportunities in this refurbishment and we have great historical centers that are empty. The only level that it's occupied is the street level. And above the city, street level, two, three floors are empty or in a very bad use. They're used as storage. It kills the life of the city that we already have. So also bring this approach to the government and see what we can start building from there. Thank you, Sara. That relates to another question from our audience. Uh, is it possible to undertake affordable housing without the help of government or other organizations? Uh, so this is related to what is the role of private real estate development? Is there a role for them? And um, are, are they still stuck in the past, as Diego said, of um, extracting value from the city, or is there a change happening in any developers to create value uh, more long term? Maybe Diego, do you want to jump in on that? 
Uh, yes, I I um, I can to um, to show uh, a, a good example that we are using now in Italy, in which. Uh, one time when a builder, um, a developer has to, to create a new, uh, a new buildings or a new district, they have to pay a tax, a specific tax called uh, our, our, um, urbanization taxation. Today, instead of this taxation, uh, gov the local government ask for the builder to realize a percentage of uh, social housing more or less from uh, 10 to 20 percent so we create a mix a mix uh, a mix of class in which there is uh, some uh, some uh, apartment dedicated to uh, a, a low um, a low rent and other one for the free market and in this way we uh, keep um, sk a skip uh, away uh, the the problem of uh, mono use uh, of, of a specific lower class or upper class and this this system has a successful in the rich region in the north of Italy, in the, uh, near Milano or near Genova, uh, has a big problem in the south, because in the south, the cost uh, of the housing is uh, very, very slow, very low. And so uh, even if uh, is uh, use this system uh, to to com to compare the free market and uh, low rent the low rent is uh, more similar is very similar to the free, free free market and so it's not so useful but in the region in which there is a high cost that system it's a, a good system without any help from states Thank you. Heather, could I ask you, because I think South Africa is a very interesting case, some of the things Diego mentioned, um, is it possible to work with private real estate developers? And then dovetailing on what he said of um, having mixed uh, economic, uh, uh, economic groups within uh, housing, and I know your work in cities is, is um, very powerful. So maybe you could address the, the question of private real estate and then mixing types of housing and types, uh, different um, sectors of users. Thank you. Um, interestingly enough, in the, um, particularly in the um, inner city of Johannesburg, um, the impact of, um, uh, lending and, and funding um, into uh, the affordable housing market by one institution in particular called Tuft has actually resulted in um, that um, almost overtaking the impact of social housing. Um, so um, by fueling small entrepreneurs to enter the affordable housing market, um, that has provided um, not only opportunities for them as small landlords and, and medium and even large size landlords, but to, to get involved in, in, in that market. And that has actually almost meant that social housing and the affordable housing market are actually playing on the same field. Um, and that's very interesting. Um, but in terms of um, uh, government, um, government involvement, that actually um, is actually lagging is, is lagging behind. Um, so I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? I can't hear you. I'm sorry, the second part first was about government and organizations. The second was about private real estate companies. Yeah. Uh, the second part of the question was about um, different um, economic levels all in the same um, place. So that's a little bit more hard to achieve. And, and I think that's where the biggest challenge lies, because certainly in, um, our, in all of our cities we, in, in South Africa, we have um, deeply embedded spatial inequality in our cities. Um, and whilst that uh, changes slightly in terms of uh, economic change, it, it still means that we have a deeply divided city. So. Um, the impact of um, 
of policies such as inclusionary housing is still certainly in its early early stages here um, and hasn't resulted in those kinds of integrations and um, and um, it's very very difficult to achieve actually because um, there's a lot of questions on on how you actually stop um, the corruption of policies like that with downward rating um, and and so on if you actually um, if you actually do provide uh, those kinds of things. So, so um, we've only just seen the implementation of inclusionary housing or it coming into some of the bigger uh, policy um, frameworks in cities like Johannesburg and Cape Town. Um, and we'll have to see how that, how that pans out. Thank you. Oscar, you spoke about very large government projects. Um, what is the situation in Turkey? Does the private sector um, have a role to play? Does it become involved in affordable housing? And if so, how? And do you see any change in this sector um, to get away from the extraction of, uh, of funds, extraction of money from a city and creation of value? I mean, um, when I think about the uh, conditions in the developing economies, uh, and the regions where developmental state policies rule, uh, and also the general uh, tendency uh, to maximize the capitalist uh, capital uh, over the real estate investments, uh, then I, ca I, I can say that uh, the situation uh, is not so bright. So uh, I think the, we need a government uh, to uh, support uh, the production of the housing for the uh, low income groups. Uh, during the last 20 years, uh, the private sector uh, had no interest in Turkey on the production of low cost housing. All the production was uh, made for the upper classes and the speculation uh, was really on top. So the uh, only production uh, was based on the ownership and produced, uh, all the units were produced by the authority, uh, central or local, by the municipalities or the administration of the government uh, that I called as Toki. Uh, so uh, I think uh, maybe if we were living in the 1970s, or 80s, uh, it may be possible to speak about the uh, production of low cost, low cost housing by the private sector. So in that case, the uh, government only uh, may have a small uh, role uh, in the intervention of this field uh, by, try, by trying to uh, avoid the uh, ghetto making uh, choices uh, by uh, making regulations uh, for social mixing. But uh, in today's conditions, uh, I'm not sure about the production of uh, affordable housing by the private sector uh, is possible, especially in geographies like mine in developing countries economy. So I am a little bit uh, pessimistic about the situation. Uh, I mean, we are just uh, trying to uh, get in touch with the uh, decision makers uh, to create uh, the governmental agencies uh, to create multiple and diver diverse, uh, to develop multiple and diverse strategies only, but uh, we don't have any chance uh, to uh, share a, a platform with the private sector. Unfortunately. Thank Unfortunately, thank you. Um, I have one more question for each person and then I will turn it over to uh, Jose Luis Cortez. So my, my final question is, as we look towards concepts of sustainability, um, SDGs, the emphasis on making our um, 
building materials, our building sites, the construction of our cities, even, even the restoration of existing buildings more sustainable. Should this be give us hope for affordable housing? Or is this something unrelated to affordable housing? Or is this something that could be a hindrance to affordable housing? And Diego, not because, uh, not because I want to always call on you first, but you're smiling. So I think you have something, something to say. So sustainability and affordable housing, what's the relationship? The, 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 I think uh, we have to experience a new typology, new material in, in, in the next uh, uh, season, of course. Uh, normally, we, we are um, used to think that the new material, the more performance is most uh, expensive. No, the, the, the challenge is to experience new material best uh, with a, a, a well, um, uh, well uh, um, performance, but with low cost. In this way, I think that uh, we have to image a new system, a new building system, um, using uh, all the all the all the material like timber, like stone, like uh, um, growth, but in a new way. In, in a new new way. Uh, in Italy, we are exper experiencing uh, just in the in the last two years the first uh, flat made by earth only earth used uh, three, three, uh, 3d uh, printer um, that create a big uh, like a big um, brick but not cooked and so uh, and without use of iron because uh, you know the iron has a uh, a big, uh, a big producer of a CO2. For one uh, tons of uh, iron, we produce one tons and eight, uh, 0.8 uh, of CO2. So we have to reduce uh, the, the use of iron in the buildings. In the north, they are using now uh, height buildings to 20 floor only in floor, uh, only in timber. Sorry, uh, but. Uh, I'm not sure that is the only solution because uh, we cut every forest if, if we, we move from cement and iron to timber. So we have to experience new, uh, new buildings. But I think that the challenge is also to move from the buildings scale to the urban scale because we have to reduce the mobility uh, need to reduce and the, the 15 minutes cities uh, may be uh, uh, an important answer in that way. Thank you, Diego. Heather, would you respond to that question, sustainability and affordability? And Heather, there still is a beeping a little bit with, I'm not sure if it's your computer or what it is, but um, um, we'd, like to hear, uh, we'd like to hear your words really clearly. Okay, I'm not sure, I've thrown my cell phone on the floor. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, it's a critical question, um, especially in cities as they become just bigger and bigger and bigger, is this um, dichotomy between small and big, and how do you actually provide services? I mean, the key things, I mean, sewage, waste disposal, water, and power. Um, I mean, these are critical because in many, many places where people live, they just don't even have access to those things. So, and I think this is the divide that I'm seeing when I'm, when we're speaking, is that there's, there's cities that are, are we so divergent now in terms of some cities talking about decarbonization and, and so on, and, 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 and the others where we actually just talking about, we don't even have a tap. Um, I mean, the critical thing at the moment is, um, especially with affordable housing, is that service costs are now almost now exceeding rental and mortgage costs. So you're paying more for power um, and water than you are for anything else. Um, and, that's, and that's really, um, I think that's the really critical thing is in sustainability is that 
it's not only your house, but it's actually water and, and power. And without those things, you, you can't actually uh, move forward and have a, a sustainable life. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oscar, uh, a brief comment on sustainability and, and affordable housing. Um, we sometimes have a chance to uh, speak uh, and develop some uh, strategies uh, about economic sustainability. For example, just supporting the microeconomy uh, in the design uh, phase. And sometimes uh, social sus sustainability issues uh, about creating a urban condition and an atmosphere for negotiation uh, in the daily life of the uh, inhabitants. And during the uh, targets on the environmental uh, sustainability, uh, I think in public housing production, uh, we don't have that much choice uh, regarding the technologies and the new materials because the uh, limited budgets does mostly do not let us uh, to use such kind of materials. So in public housing, uh, regarding the materials, uh, I cannot uh, pronounce sustainability, uh, environmental sustainability. So in brief, the economic and social sustainability strategies are on the table. But uh, in the design uh, process, uh, it's hard to talk about the technologies and the materials, the use of technology and the materials. Great. Th thank you, Oscar. I, I hope that we can be more optimistic in the future. Sara, you have uh, just one minute and then Jose Luis will take over. So if you would like to briefly close out uh, the dialogue and we'll turn it over to Jose Luis Cortez. Well, uh, I take the advantage of, of talking because the good things we're doing in Mexico is, yes, most houses have solar heated water. And um, many houses have now solar panels. And um, there's a bonus to houses that have uh, paint that reduces the um, change between heat and cold. And uh, there are a few um, good things happening. So all of that contribute to less use of energy and it contributes to the user that they pay less also in energy. So in that way, we are walking in the right path. And I, I want to take the opportunity because in the morning I was so uh, <laughs> willing to start that I forgot to express my gratitude for the invitation to participate in this webinar on affordable housing. It, it was a pleasure and an honor to be in the same panel with my friend, Pal uh, uh, Krishna Doshi, of course, with my friend and president of the UIA, Jose Luis Cortez, and a privilege to be with all of you with uh, Diego Sopi, with uh, Oscar Osgur Bingol, with Heather Dodd, and last but not least with you, my dear friend and admired friend, Martha Thorne. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Sara. Jose Luis, would you uh, close out the webinar for us, please? You have to unmute yourself, my dear. <laughs> No, we still can't hear you, Jose Luis. Um, maybe go to the bottom of your screen and you'll see an audio microphone if you click on that. Well, uh, no, Jose Luis, we, it's, your, it's the computer. So if you'll allow me, um, because, uh, um, because I feel that I know you and I don't want to take the words from your mouth, Jose Luis, but I do want to say that I think as a kickoff event to the housing forum, the international forum that the UIA and other organizations will be holding in Madrid in May, this is a wonderful way to start it. Um, I would like to thank not only our speakers who've done an amazing job in preparing 
and spending two hours um, and joining us from places as far away as India on one hand and Mexico on the other hand. Thank you so much for being here. To our large audience and the people who were following us also on streaming, it's been wonderful. And now, now I see now we Marta, have Jose can, Luis. Can you hear, oh, sorry, what's a problem with the system here. On the name of the International Union of Architects, I want to congratulate all of you to uh, very good questions from the audience as well. All your participants have been excellent, but I tell you that one of the reasons why the UIJ wants to promote these webinars, and I hope a similar webinar will be in each country because the situation is very different in each continent. You know, we uh, have in Africa or in Asia or in Latin America, really uh, big problems in the outskirts of the cities with all the, po the poverty around. And uh, it's quite different from Europe and uh, uh, developed countries. But one of the points that we want to uh, raise is that we have to be more resilient. You know, after the pandemic era, we have to be more resilient. And we believe that uh, the housing will be most important topic for the next years. And I hope that for the forum that we are going to have in Madrid in the 17, 18, 19, and 20 of May of year 2022, you can bring from each country good proposals. We need actions, not too much blah, 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 uh, or the young people says. So work hard during January, February, March, April, in order that each country can bring some actions. We know that the housing problem is those don't belong just to architects, that we need to convince public sector, private sector, developers, uh, uh, everybody to participate, you know, all professions, economists, uh, engineers, uh, sociologists. We need everybody because housing belongs to everybody. But uh, architects, we can be the leaders in the matter of space because it's our matter, not to design space. And I hope that uh, everybody will be really uh, uh, in committed to change the world. We have to do a lot. We cannot allow that another 5 million of people will die by another virus. We have to, to be prepared that most of the houses have a very good sanitation system with good ventilation, good uh, 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 sun, you know, everywhere and good garbage disposals. So we have to be designing better community and environments for everybody, clean environments for everybody. Thank you very much.